So, okay, we're live. Uh, so, again, welcome. Uh, my name is Tim, uh, otherwise known as Citizen Tim, and I am the uh, founder and technical director of a uh, Drupal agency in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And I have been building the web as my sort of sole means of support since 1994. Um, and as a result of that, I've been through uh, many sort of uh, key and fundamental changes in how we are going about building the web. And uh, the last one is this uh, sort of notion that JavaScript is slowly coming to eat us all. And so this session is sort of a uh, uh, high-level exploration of that and sort of my journey over the past uh, probably, you know, really in the past year and over the past couple years of really diving uh, deeply into this both as a developer and as a business owner and as uh, just someone who builds the web. So, all right, let's get started. So how many of you here uh, remember the Dean Scream in 2004? Okay, so for those of you who don't, uh, this picture was taken on the night of the uh, Iowa caucus in 2004. Four, and at the time, Howard Dean was a uh, uh, presidential candidate who was at the top of all the polls. He had raised more money than any other candidate. And because of this scream, I'm not, let's see if I have this audio here. I don't know if that played, but that was Howard Dean. That was a one-second clip of him at the end of this speech going, Rawr! That scream uh, tanked his presidential campaign, which is hard to believe in, in, in the year 2019 that a one-second scream literally destroyed his, his presidential campaign. But the reason I bring up the Dean scream is because it's a convenient starting point for a sort of fundamental uh, period in, webs, in the web's history, starting in about 2004, when we moved into what I call sort of the industrial revolution of the web. Um, and the reason I bring up Howard Dean is because if, if you remember, and if you were in Drupal in those days, uh, he was largely driven by the internet. He was the first candidate to get uh, thousands and thousands of small donations, and this was all driven by a project called Dean Spaces, which was Drupal, Drupal 4. Um, it was built, in fact, by a uh, uh, couple of the Pantheon founders, Josh and Zach, and others, of course, um, and they quickly transitioned into the first uh, sort of widely acknowledged Drupal services company that was uh, making money uh, working on Drupal and really contributed to this sort of 10-year uh, period with uh, what I would call the rise and domination of the content management system. Um, this is when Drupal and WordPress and all of these other CMSs, uh, Joomla, uh, really started coming into their own and people sort of started standardizing on how we were uh, going about building the web we saw the rise of commercial CMSs and software as a service. Uh, the LAMP stack was sort of at the heart of all this, and then eventually we got the cloud, and through this period we had Ajax and jQuery. Uh, Gmail came out in 2004, and uh, if you were around then, uh, it kind of blew everyone's minds because it was the first uh, online application that really felt like an application, not a website. But then in 2004, or 14, I should say, uh, something interesting happened, and, and it marks what I believe is sort of this next big uh, shift, uh, similar to the technological revolution or the second industrial revolution. Um, and that was sort of predicated by these first three here, React, Angular, and Vue. Um, they all came out, uh, they were either open sourced or released within about a six month period right around the start of 2014. Uh, they are, of course, JavaScript uh, frameworks or libraries. React uh, was built by Facebook, Angular by Google and Vue by an independent developer, but combined they sort of started this shift of thinking about uh, how we're building the web a little bit differently. Then we started hearing about decoupled CMSs. If you were at a, a Drupal camp any time between 2014 and present, you probably saw multiple, multiple sessions about decoupled or headless CMSs and how we use Drupal. We had the rise of uh, Node.js and all these other JavaScript libraries. More recently, the Jamstack, and this, which I'll talk a little bit about more later, and this idea of interacting with APIs, uh, managed server, server services, and of course serverless, which is another sort of new thing. Um, and I believe, again, that that started in about 2014 and moves into today. Um, and so despite that, so how many people here have, have launched a uh, fully decoupled site, whether using Drupal or any other CMS? Zero. One. Okay. So the, I gave a version of this talk uh, in the Twin Cities, and I think we had about two or three. And I'm, I'm the same. We're, we're just now working on our first big projects uh, using some of these uh, new tools. And the reason is, is it's actually still a pretty great place to be. Um, 
This uh, up here are, are some of the biggest brands that Drupal is currently running. Over on the other side is uh, some of the larger WordPress brands. And everyone's, I think, pretty aware that uh, combined WordPress and Joomla and Drupal uh, drive just about 40% of the overall web. And it really has become sort of the obvious and default solution for how, in 2019, most people are going about building websites. And again, uh, frankly, it's for a very good reason. So obviously, there's a lot of uh, companies here at this camp and across the world and across Drupal and WordPress. It literally is a multi-billion dollar global marketplace. Innovation has not stopped. Uh, with WordPress, you see things like uh, Gutenberg. And with Drupal, of course, uh, we're getting a new release every six months now. And uh, people are working on the uh, JavaScript initiative for <clears throat> the Drupal backend. And frankly, they really are still, for a company like mine and for a lot of other companies, the obvious way that we build websites. So that said, um, at least in my world and probably yours, there's some very clear evidence that things are changing and, and quickly. And so these next few slides are just going to sort of demonstrate that a little bit. Um, this is using Google Trends, which lets you uh, plug in uh, terms and see how they have trended in general interest over time. Uh, so this is reacted angular and again you can see right at about 2014 uh, we start to get this hockey stick like uh, uh, growth of these frameworks headless cms almost identical um, you know obviously people started talking about headless and decoupled cms's in in conjunction with this idea of a, a front-end framework uh, progressive web apps full stack developer um, and often when people say that term they're talking about javascript developers working on the front and the back end and, and you could overlay those four slides on each other and you'd have this, basically this identical uh, hockey stick uh, showing up right at about 2014 and continuing to grow uh, through today. Now, here's the same exact time period for Drupal and WordPress. And you can see that uh, both of these projects peaked right at about 2011 or, or about three quarters of the way through that 10 year sort of uh, industrial revolution uh, period. Uh, and CMSs in general uh, peaked even earlier. You know, we built up to that through through what you might call the renaissance of all these people sort of cobbling things together and building their own CMSs. That hit its peak right, you know, pretty close to that start of, of that 2014 um, in, um, industrial revolution period. So beyond those stats, this is a, a real quote from a um, RFP response that we got just recently from a, a client where we asked some questions about the project and we're, or we're trying to bid on this and this is the response we got back. You know, we would steer clear of Drupal. And they were literally, as we explored more, they were really looking for that third option, JavaScript-based applications. Um, as I said, I've been doing this for a long time uh, in Drupal since uh, Drupal 5 was our first production Drupal, set, uh, Drupal site. This is very different from what it used to be. We, we, we and a lot of other Drupal companies uh, spent many years uh, literally fending off people, uh, sending us emails saying, we want a Drupal site. We don't want a website. We don't want this. We want Drupal. You guys do Drupal. Therefore, we would like to hire you. Um, we are starting to see uh, more of this now. And lastly, this is a tweet from uh, Nadir Dabit, who is a fairly well-known person in the uh, React world. He works for Oz Amplify. Uh, this is a tweet from a few months ago where he notes there's a massive paradigm shift happening right now, and I'll skip the rest and go down to those who acknowledge and take advantage of this will be the biggest winners in the coming years. So that's something that I've come to uh, believe a little bit in all of these stats, and it leads to uh, the first important realization of this session, and that is that we are really rapidly changing how and what we build. Um, as we, as we will see in a bit, uh, things are starting to look very different for people who are building the web. So in the face of that, uh, one option that a lot of people, as we saw by the show of hands and including my company, are still doing is like staying the course and sort of putting blinders on and knowing that, you know, hey, we can build really good websites in Drupal. Uh, this is an old saying, I think from the probably 50s or 60s is where it started. Uh, nobody ever got fired. Uh, for buying IBM. And the idea was this is a proven, uh, stable, good solution for a lot of things. And if you just choose IBM, everything will be okay. And I think that is a, sort of the prevailing attitude of a lot of 
not only uh, developers, but clients and organizations who think, you know, we know Drupal or WordPress works. Um, and that said, so these, this is from that same, uh, this is the uh, recent stats here. I like to show this. Uh, uh, front page has not been a, a, a product since 2007, and yet it still powers 0.5%, I'm sorry, 0.3% of the web. Adobe Dreamweaver is still a product and, and powers 0.4% of the web. Um, I find both of those a little remarkable, but it's my way of saying that if, if in five years from now or 10 years from now, you are still building Drupal sites or WordPress sites, you will probably still have a job and there will be a place for you. It's not, not going away uh, anytime soon. Uh, but that said, uh, there's another option and that's to learn and adapt. And as I said earlier, that sort of, uh, I literally have spent the last year of my life sort of uh, uh, from every level, from a business owner level to a developer level to working with our team and our clients of really diving into this uh, JavaScript world and, and trying to figure out what it's all about and what we are doing and why we're doing it and if perhaps there's a better way to do it. So uh, the remainder of this session will be sort of... Um, a, a, a bit of a journey through through my lens of, of how that went and some tips for you guys and just sort of what we're really fundamentally talking about here and, and why it's happening and who it's affecting and uh, what you can do about it. So what we're really talking about here, um, <clears throat> we're not talking about Drupal or WordPress versus anything. We're talking about this idea of a monolithic CMS, which is Drupal, WordPress, Squarespace, uh, Wix, uh, any any system like that, um, and I'll, I have a, some slides describing this a little bit more, versus this new way of, of thinking about things, including decoupled uh, front ends and API integrations and managed services and microservices and serverless. Um, and of course, uh, the, the reason for this session is that almost 100% that is being driven by JavaScript. It's not Ruby, it's not Python. Uh, for whatever reason, JavaScript uh, has won. And uh, that's likely because it has, it's one of the oldest languages on the web. Uh, it's, it's uh, uh, I think the stat, I don't have a slide for it, but I think those same uh, website statistics show that 98% of every website on the planet is using some form of JavaScript. So back to a monolithic uh, CMS. This is sort of uh, what, our, what our world looks like today. In the center, you have your CMS, whether it's WordPress or Drupal or Sitecore or Adobe Experience Manager, they're all the same. They all, we're all working on the same fundamental uh, principles, and that is that everything drives through the CMS, whether you're talking about your content management, building custom tools, um, integrating with other things, it will be Drupal talking to those things. Um, if you have a membership system, it's probably going to be on Drupal. If you're going to customize something, it's going to go through Drupal. Uh, commerce, you will probably install the Commerce module. For Search, you will install the Search API module. Forums and galleries and basically everything filters through this CMS, through a traditional web server and a database server. And at the end, it spits out your front end. Right? That's sort of uh, the model that, that has worked so well for so many people for so long. Um, so this is, uh, most people have probably heard this, I refer to it as the golden hammer, and it says, I suppose it is tempting if the only tool you have is a hammer to treat everything as if it were a nail. Now, I personally have been uh, guilty of this for large chunks of my career because it's very true. When you are working with a system like Drupal and a client comes to you with a problem, your immediate thought is, oh, Drupal can do that, we can do that, sure. Um, which in some ways is, is, is great, um, but it can also be a bit of a problem. Um, and when I say it's great, you know, there's a reason. This is Drupal's growth curve uh, at the start of that 10-year uh, period in 2004. There's a reason that we had this growth curve and why everyone is still using Drupal and WordPress uh, today, because it's really great and we can solve really hard problems. We can solve them really well. Um, satisfy, you know, I, one of the things I frequently say in clients' meeting is like, look, if you want us to uh, build Drupal to, uh, you know, talk to a satellite in the moon and send us data back, we can do it, right? It's just sort of like this idea that Drupal can do so many things, as can WordPress and, and many of the other sort of monolithic uh, CMSs. So in comparison, this is sort of uh, my impression of what, the, what I'll call the modern web um, looks like. Instead of a, a CMS sitting in the center, um, you have something else, and that can be, uh, it's typically if you're working on a server-based application, which I'll say a little bit more about later, 
It'll be something like Node.js. Um, a lot of these projects are now being hosted uh, statically, um, including things like Gatsby, which I have a slide about later, uh, or serverless functions, which is this idea that you are, uh, the best way I can think to describe serverless functions in the Drupal world is let's say you have a, a beer review site and you want to let people uh, give ratings, right? In Drupal, you would install the flag module or the rating module and it would all be stored in Drupal. This idea of a serverless function is that you can um, uh, have a single purpose function living on a server that is completely spun down on something like uh, Oz Lambda or there's a few other competitors. And when someone rates that beer, it just quickly calls that, that it, it's still a, it's a, it's a bad word because there's still a server, but it will call that server uh, update your rating and be done and then spin back down again. And so it's a very new paradigm from, from what we've talked about. And then cloud native is the other term that people use a lot. And so, but the difference here is that all of these other things, whether you're managing your content, uh, you might have some data living in a Google Sheet or an Airtable, you might be doing your commerce on Shopify, you might be authenticating your users on a service called Auth0 or a similar. Um, you might have uh, a bunch of static files or markdown that your developers are using. Uh, you might use a service like Algolia for search or integrate with custom a a APIs. Uh, you might have custom uh, database applications living in a MongoDB or, or uh, JSON and XML living out there. And rather than running that all through one central system, a monolithic CMS like Drupal, the idea is that this cloud in the middle sort of handles all that and then what becomes uh, much more prevalent then is the front end. It's not Drupal putting it out, it's uh, yeah, you sort of bring your own, whether it's React or Angular or Vue or some other uh, framework. And so important realization too, I think, is that in this world, we're no longer building websites, right? What we are building are front end experiences and uh, methods, uh, device agnostic methods for people to interact well with the things that we are building. And in this world, we are not building a web page. We are building potentially multiple front ends using all of that uh, data. And so one of my arguments is that most of this stuff, if not all of it, has pretty much been solved and commoditized. Um, you know, Lots of these things, like Auth0 has a free tier. Uh, Shopify, you can start for $9.99 a month. Uh, Contentful, which I'll talk a little bit about more later, you subscribe to it and it's your CMS. Um, and then you can, of course, do custom things. And sort of a, a lot of the hard problems that Drupal has solved over the year, really, you know, over that 10-year period, we have solved those problems. And so then you might ask, okay, well, if that's the case, what actually is our job? And I would argue that our job literally is to build good front ends and good user experiences for people. We're not uh, your average client or your average user. They don't want a website or a, a Drupal page or a WordPress. They want something uh, useful and easy to use and fast for whatever goal they are trying to accomplish. So. It is very easy to, to listen to all this and see all those stats and, and still be skeptical. And believe me, I, I uh, have many of these moments myself where you know, I'm knee deep in a, a Gatsby project or trying to explain to a client why all of these little pieces need to be connected together in a way that they're not, you know, a lot of clients, this is brand new to them also, and they've, you know, just like us, have been in that 10 year period getting used to how we build websites. And when it's something different, it can be very, very hard to overcome this, this uh, bit of skepticism that like, look, what, why, are we, why are we doing this? Um, and these are all valid questions. Can't Drupal also provide a good user experience? Well, of course it can. Um, if we go back to that earlier slide where I showed all those giant uh, websites and websites that you've built and websites that we have built, they're great. Um, and why would I give up all of its out-of-box features? You know, the fact is Drupal has solved all of these very, very hard problems that you, in many cases, now need to solve another way. And that's a very, very hard thing to give up. And then why add a whole other layer of complication ex and expense? Um, especially historically, it's, uh, I have always believed um, until the past year or so that doing this, this model uh, literally doubles your effort level, your budget, your support and maintenance burden, and, and you sort of get to this point like, well, why? Why would we uh, double all of that to, and for, to what gain, basically, is, I guess, is the question. 
And so my answer to that is, uh, uh, from the dawn of time, web developers have sought to build websites and to build them faster. That is literally what I've been doing for my career since 1994. Uh, no one wants to build a bad website and give something slow and clunky to the client. And so as web developers, I think our job is to sort of uh, uh, keep that in mind. Like, you know, we're trying to find the best way possible to build this. And maybe uh, there's a better way to do it than the way that we've been doing it for uh, that 10 year period between 2004 and 2014. So I'm gonna go through a few of these, but I would argue that by uh, most common uh, sort of metrics here, like speed and performance, flexibility, user experience, developer experience, and overall cost, that just in the past, say, three years, maybe even two years, you can make an objective argument that the sort of modern web checks all of those boxes more than a traditional CMS, and here's, here's why. Um, speed, obviously that's become a huge critical part of building the web. Um, Google now penalizes for slow sites, uh, clients leave after one second, and in this modern uh, JavaScript world, just sort of out of the box, uh, you get these things like critical rendering, which is just rendering stuff on your page that the user is actually seeing, uh, code splitting and pre-renders where things are loading uh, silently right below the viewport, um, and uh, one little snippet of CMS, CSS is getting loaded instead of a, a giant uh, uh, CSS file, uh, server-side rendering, and then it all runs uh, typically on Node, which is uh, literally uh, extracted from Chrome. It's the, called the V8 engine. Um, it's extremely fast for doing the types of things we do in Drupal. And then even more so now, if you look at sites, uh, projects like Gatsby um, that are, uh, it's complicated to describe because it's not static, it's literally a React app, but it is hosted in a static manner. And if you install a, a Gatsby site, you will often find that you're getting uh, 100s across the board on your, on your Google Lighthouse scores. And if you've ever tried to get a Drupal site, 7 or 8, anywhere close to that, A, I've never gotten a Drupal site to 100, not even close. Um, I have gotten them in the 90s, but it takes work and more work and more work and front-end developers and optimizing images, whereas out of the box with something like Gatsby, it just works and it's uh, blazingly fast is their slogan and it's true. Uh, flexibility, I would argue that despite how flexible Drupal really is and all of those things that it can do, um, that this, this idea of the modern web is even more flexible in that it's 100% data agnostic. It doesn't matter if you are pulling in data from Drupal or Airtable or a Shopify inventory system, it, it just simply doesn't matter. It's front-end agnostic, meaning um, in this model you're not only putting out websites, but you're potentially putting out native apps. Uh, uh, display screens on a, uh, uh, a big screen, a uh, hallway monitor, whatever it might be, a television, I'll, you know. With this idea of a decoupled front end, you really uh, get a lot more power in that regard as opposed to relying on Twig and, and what Drupal puts out. And then lastly, it really does allow you to use the right tool for the right job. You know, Drupal Commerce is, is spectacular, but it's also a beast. And a lot of people just need something simple and proven that works, and that could be Shopify which would plug in uh, very nicely with, with this uh, system. Uh, user experience, this one gets a little bit more subjective, but I would say um, arguably, um, uh, you know, this is, this is of course all predicated on, on people doing a good job. I've seen plenty of horrible, slow uh, JavaScript based sites, but all other things being equal, it's gonna be faster. Um, I would argue more effective and more delightful. Um, and again, that's a little subjective, but I think most people would agree that when you are on your phone browsing a really well-built web app, whether it's Instagram or, or Facebook or whatever it might be, that you just get this feeling um, with no page uh, reloads and m uh, micro interactions and all of these sort of things that are very difficult to do sometimes in Drupal or WordPress. The developer experience. So this one I know well because I have uh, sort of forcefully uh, started switching our entire team into this world along with me, and I think all of us agree um, but there's this pretty cool feeling that when you are all working on one stack, meaning JavaScript, and, and the front end and the back end are, are sort of working together, that it, it's really sort of empowering and that, you know, we have our front end developers now able to write GraphQL queries and pull data into a Gatsby site um, in a way that before was sort of foreign to them, and this makes it really easy. Um, I would argue that it is uh, faster, largely due to uh, things like uh, components and NPM libraries and hot reloading. It's just, I have found it to be a very, uh, 
It brings me back, frankly, to that first 10-year period of 1994 with the uh, sort of the Renaissance where we were building everything by hand and, and, and artfully putting things together. It sort of brings back that feeling. Um, and this one may be the most controversial and the one where, for me, the jury is still out. But, uh, you know, five years ago, everyone, again, would say, you know what, you're going to double your cost. Uh, I would argue that if you do it right, that actually may not be true and that you can actually build... Uh, sites more affordably on this stack than you might on a Drupal site. And that comes down to uh, increased development time um, in that if you, say, standardize on something like React and start building up a component library, um, it becomes really easy to then start moving those things uh, to, to other projects um, and to iterate on your own projects. Support and maintenance is very different because in this world, you are not supporting a server with security risks and, and um, uh, patches that come out uh, once a month on Wednesdays and all of these things that you have to do. You know, you're, not, you're not dealing with typically a caching layer in Drupal and all of these things that typically cause lots of support and maintenance problems. And then hosting and infrastructure. Again, this one's a little debatable, but if you do go into the world of, of things like uh, Gatsby, for instance, these sites can be hosted uh, for free on services like Netlify and they will talk to your Drupal site, and uh, of course that's a free tier. Once you uh, move up, you start charging, but the fact is um, you no longer need uh, two giant infrastructures to support this type of, of website. So you might, you know, objectively again, you might say that, okay, boy, uh, on all five of those metrics and criteria, uh, this modern web is, is winning. Like, it's doing all of these things better. So that may be true, uh, but important realization number three is despite all that, you still will need a CMS because you still are going to have, you know, presumably you're not going to train all of your content editors to start writing markdown files and pushing them to GitHub. You, you, that's just not going to happen. You know, I would love for that to happen, but it's not going to happen. Instead, you are still going to have staffs of content editors who need things like workflow and scheduling and... Uh, being able to embed media and do all these things that we've been doing over the past 10 years in Drupal. So luckily, there are some CMSs. This is a, a recent article from cmswire.com, 24 headless CMS that should be on your radar in 2019. Uh, raise your hand if you've seen or heard of any of these ones in yellow in particular. So okay, so I'm guessing a lot of you are saying it for Contentful, maybe? That seems to be the most popular one. Um, but these are the ones that should be on your radar. There are many, many more of these CMSs. One thing you'll notice about this list, what's missing? Drupal. Drupal, Drupal doesn't even make this list. Uh, they don't even write about it. It's not talked about, nor is WordPress. These are all uh, a combination of companies and, and open source product, product, projects who are recognizing, you know, hey, we have this great way to build a, a modern web. How are we going to actually then populate it with content? And so many, many dozens of companies have recognized this and are, are starting to go into business doing this. And if you look at some of the pricing, you get feature parity with something like Drupal at Contentful, and by feature parity I mean things like record limitations and uh, roles, etc. You very quickly get up to almost $1,000 a month, $879. Uh, Graph CMS, $499 for that same feature parity bit. Um, but almost all of these have, have free tiers where you can click a button on, say, something like sanity.io and have a site that's talking to your GitHub and your Gatsby site in about 30 seconds. So it's uh, quite remarkable. Um, and a lot of them are open source, just like Drupal. Uh, uh, people have started these smaller uh, projects to try to handle this problem. So that brings us to Drupal and why I'm here and why you're here and... and uh, why it's even still part of this discussion. Um, and I believe it's an important part of this discussion. Um, and it started, uh, obviously it started long before this, but it, uh, this is a, a blog post from uh, Dries's uh, annual State of Drupal presentation at DrupalCon New Orleans in 2016. And in it, he said, I shared my thoughts where we should focus our efforts in order for Drupal to continue its path to become the leading platform for assembling the world's best digital experiences. As part of that announcement and as part of this uh, uh, presentation, he announced the API First Initiative and appointed uh, Greg Dunlap, I think, and several others to sort of 
had this effort of making sure that Drupal uh, has a seat at the table here, um, despite that list that I just showed you earlier. So that was, uh, I'm gonna mute myself here, sorry. That was 2016. Um, this was just a couple months ago um, when Drupal, I think it was 8.7 came out. Uh, so three years later, he was able to post a blog post that says the best JSON API implementation in existence. The JSON API module is almost certainly the most feature complete and easiest to use JSON API implementation in existence, okay? So, and uh, in this world, that is absolutely 100% true. I don't know how many of you are already hopefully using Drupal 8, and if you are, in Drupal 8 core, if you're running a recent version, you can click uh, one button and turn on the JSON API module. With zero configuration and doing nothing else, you now have your entire data set exposed as a JSON API endpoint that any one of these front end libraries or systems can now consume, okay? Um, that is uh, huge. So not only did, did we do this over the past three years, but we did it really, really well in a very easy way to use. Like literally, you click this button and you visit slash JSON API. This is a, a, a Chrome plugin, so yours might not look quite as nice right away, but you are going to see your data and you can start clicking through to it. You can see I'm at uh, JSON API node slash page. It's all there. Your taxonomy terms, your data, your relationships, your entity references are all exposed in this JSON API, which means that other systems can then consume that. So that brings us to important realization number four, and that is that Drupal solved most of the hard problems 10 years ago or more. All of those 24 companies that I showed you um, are all actively working on catching up with you know, 15 to 20 years of work that we've done as Drupal to get all of these features into their system and, and to do them well. Um, in fact, there was a Twitter exchange, I think, with the CEO of, of, I think it was Contentful, and someone was complaining like, this is ridiculous, I'm paying uh, $900 a month and I can't schedule a post. And that, that, at that point, I don't know if it still is, that was true. And uh, the CEO responded back like, look, we get it. Uh, and I think the, the, the earlier tweeter had actually said, like, this is something we've been doing in Drupal for five years or 10 years. And he responded like, look, we literally are playing catch up with all of these uh, other systems that have been around for so long. So tell us, what do you need? You need scheduling? Okay, great, we'll, we'll build it. But the fact is, with Drupal's model for content architecture and nodes and taxonomies and entity references and workflow and permissions, scheduling, uh, the media library, and how we handle files. Those are all like battle-tested things that we worked really, really hard at as a community to do really well and, and in one way, right? Like there's not two entity reference modules. There's one way in Drupal to, to reference an entity. Uh, I'm gonna check my time here. Oh, I gotta hurry up. Uh, okay, so important realization five, uh, Drupal is still the bomb. It's free and open source. Uh, as we saw, it's API first, and unlike virtually all of these other services, there's, no, there's nothing like a record limitation. A lot of these are based on, hey, do you have 10,000 records? Okay, you're gonna pay more. And a record, by the way, is a, everything from a single taxonomy term to a user to a piece of content, etc. cetera. Um, and it's arguably better. I've, I've logged into uh, not all of those 24, but a big handful of them, and I would argue that in many ways, Drupal is just better at the fundamentals of, of managing content, and so it is the right tool for this job. And so in our last few minutes, um, this will be a highly opinionated and, and frankly, because of my time, a little brief overview of, of my journey through this and how we sort of uh, came to terms with this uh, fact that things are changing so fast and how we can get in front of it and um, sort of survive in this, in this new paradigm. So what I could do is explain what this looked like five years ago. Um, it used, again, used to be very complicated and very expensive. You'd be running a node server and quickly get into things like Express and Redux and Babel and Webpack and trying to configure all this together. And uh, then you'd pull in your data and then you'd have React and Angular and Vue on the top of it. And it uh, very, very complicated, right? Well, in the past uh, year or two, um, things have become uh, quite a bit easier um, in some respects. And so again, this is highly opinionated um, and certainly uh, not the end of the story, but I would argue uh, your first step is to uh, stop the paralysis and choose one of these front end frameworks. Um, you see people like, oh, should I use Angular or Vue or something different? 
Frankly, uh, React, a JavaScript library for building user interfaces, which is what I talked about earlier. Like, that is our job now. It doesn't do much, you know, it's, uh, people have the sense that React is really hard and complicated, and, you know, it is a little bit, but really, it's uh, a very lightweight tool for building these amazing user interfaces. And so I would, you know, if you're looking to get started, I would start there. Again, it's in WordPress and uh, quickly becoming a part of Drupal soon with the JavaScript initiative. So. It's also, the, uh, by a fairly large margin, the most popular of these front-end frameworks, so it's a good place to start. Uh, Gatsby, there's, uh, I think, at least one or maybe two or three sessions at this conference about Gatsby, and I would highly encourage you to go, but it solves, out of the box, virtually every one of those problems on the sl two slides ago that I talked about, where you used to have to configure all these things, and it took months. Uh, I guarantee you, for anyone in here who is a, uh, even a beginner developer, can go to the Gatsby documentation pages. Uh, there's a Drupal content source plugin that allows Gatsby to talk to Drupal, and what it does is uh, pulls data from something like Drupal or Contentful or WordPress or and or Markdown files and other data, and using an amazing uh, technology called GraphQL, which is basically a query language that allows you to talk to all of those things. Gatsby hydrates that all into a functional, uh, fully hydrated React application that is hosted statically for free on something like Netlify. Um, it's amazing. That's all I'll say because I'm running out of time, but it, that really is where our journey has led us, um, is to Gatsby. Uh, beyond that is a framework called Next, um, which is not static. It's very similar to Gatsby, but if you are doing things where you need instant data coming into your system from a server, it does the same thing as Gatsby in that world, in that it solves all of these problems um, that you would otherwise have. Uh, I listened to a podcast called Syntax FM, um, and one of their hosts uh, earlier this year, uh, they, they gave a podcast that I, would, that I highly recommend called Gatsby versus Next. And his quote was, I would never build anything in React without choosing Next or Gatsby. And that's because they literally solve all of these problems for you. Uh, the Jamstack, um, Gatsby is a Jamstack uh, uh, project. It's this idea, uh, it's a modern web development architecture based on client-side JavaScript, reusable APIs, and pre-built markup. Um, I don't have time now to talk a lot about it, but uh, Google it, uh, learn about it, because it really, I believe, is the future of how many, many websites are going to uh, be built and hosted. Um, and so the other sort of interesting thing about this world um, is that you have all these services like Netlify and Now, which are both uh, hosting companies for these platforms. You have these tools like CodePen and Code Sandbox and Glitch that allow, you know, frankly, by the time I finish the slide, you could uh, log into uh, Sandbox and uh, instantly create a, a Gatsby application that's just working for you right out of the box and you haven't left your browser, and yet you have a code editor and a way to push that to GitHub and a way to push that to Netlify. Most of them have one-click demos and free tiers and, uh, frankly, uh, documentation that sort of puts the Drupal documentation to shame in a lot of ways and that it's really, really good in most cases and very uh, task-focused. Okay, I have a, okay, we're doing okay on time. So that all leads me to believe, uh, leads me to important realization number six, and that's that things that were very hard five years ago are suddenly becoming uh, quite easy and, as I said before, almost fun. Um, and that you can really very rapidly um, get one of these systems up and running. So this is, a, this is important realization number seven, and it's a key one, um, and that is to say that none of this is a panacea. It's not going to solve all your problems. If you're familiar with it, this is an old popular uh, Reddit meme, and the idea is uh, would you rather fight one duck-sized horse or a hundred horse-sized ducks? And if you picture uh, Drupal or any other monolithic CMS as a big giant duck and all of these other things that I've been talking about as a hundred little uh, duck-sized horses, um, you know, it's, it, you're still going to have problems. You're still going to have battles to fight. And it's just a matter of what you're uh, fighting, really. Um, and again, you know, I'm, I'm still new enough at this that I don't necessarily have the answer to which one of these would win, and it's still really hard to convince clients that a hundred little uh, uh, duck-sized horses are going to be easier than just dealing with Drupal, and that very well may be true, but uh, in a lot of ways I don't think it's true. 
Uh, and so I'm going to leave you with uh, this. This is a, a tweet from earlier in the year by Kyle Matthews, who was the founder of, of Gatsby. And I share it because I think it's a very uh, succinct and simple way to describe what we've just been talking about for the past 40 minutes. And that is, websites are just derived data, y'all. And when you really think about it, that's what a website is, right? We're pulling in data from somewhere and, and hopefully rendering it in a good way to our people, whether they're on their phone or their laptops or a desktop, it doesn't matter. It's like our job then is to figure out the best way to take that data and build good user experiences for people. And I think our job as web developers is to uh, recognize some of the things I've talked about today and to uh, hopefully find a way to uh, bring ourselves into that world. So with that, thank you. And I did leave myself with uh, four minutes for questions. So if you have any, I'm happy to answer. Otherwise, I'll be around for the rest of the uh, conference to talk. Yep. So what I think about when when we use Drupal, like we pretty much leverage like views, taxonomy, yep. and then like redirects. So I mean, do all those things just sort of translate over into the decouple? Do you, do you build that into your back end? Yeah, so, so so I didn't obviously have, I, I had to take out a bunch of slides to get this into 45 minutes, but I did have a slide about just that, the sort of hard problems, and one of them is redirects, um, especially with Drupal, because that JSON API will give you back as your URL, internal colon node three. Great, What you know, what does that mean to my front end? But it will also give you back the, the uh, Keep the first alias path to solve that problem, you're sort of the one-to-one -one mapping between that node ID and your path, but it won't give you back, at least that we've found yet, your redirect paths. And so that's still a hard problem that we're uh, trying to work on. Um, Gatsby in particular has a create redirect method where you can pass it a to and a from and it will do those redirects for you, but we are still trying to figure out how to get those human-friendly paths into that system. And there are, of course, number of other hard problems too that you have to sort of you know think through like oh geez how how are menus going to work right like in Drupal you just build your menu and put it on the page well the JSON IP API isn't so great at, at bringing back that data so we've had to come up with more creative solutions for for doing that but so far we haven't hit anything that has stopped us so yep accessibility a problem when building so it really can be, uh, but like, like Drupal and a lot of other projects, um, a lot of these JavaScript frameworks are now treating that as 100% first class citizen. In particular, Gatsby has a whole uh, you know, uh, uh, team working on accessibility right now. And uh, similar to Drupal, um, you can do it really badly, really easily. But also, like Drupal, um, it's just being baked more and more into the framework to, to make it easy for you to do the right thing when it comes to accessibility. So um, the sites that we've been building are scoring 100% on the Lighthouse Accessibility Score, so I know that it is also very doable to build a very accessible site in this model. Yep? What about sending data back like, through a form? So in, in the Gatsby world, that's a little tricky because it's a statically generated React app. So for those sites, what we've been using are um, uh, services like uh, Netlify offers a free uh, form submission tool that allows you to take emails or send them elsewhere. You can also build, um, basically, uh, because it's a React app, you can build a custom tool to send data off to somewhere or to pull data in. Um, but when you really get into that type of thing, especially where you're trying to pull data in uh, constantly, that's when you start looking at, at Next.js instead of something like Gatsby, which solves both of those problems, data in and data out. All right, anyone else? What about metadata? Uh, like what type of metadata? Um, pushing it from the CMS into the, into the app. That already built into the API. Mm, again, it sort of depends on what you mean, but uh, like in my world, I call taxonomies metadata, right? Like that's to me, that's metadata on a node, and in that case, yes. Um, the the there's the metadata module. In that case, also yes. So I think to answer your question, most of the answer is yes. Most of that is exposed and available to these other systems. So. 
All right, well, we're right at 11, so uh, thank you again, and I uh, hope to see you and chat with you all later.